Previously on the Sugar Baby Confessionals. The short version is I met a woman three years after being on the site. We had an arrangement. You know, it seemed like a standard arrangement. I would see her twice a week. I would give her this amount of money. We would keep it casual. She could see other men. I could see other women. But of course, we fell in love. Over the course of the relationship, I discovered that she had an eating disorder, that she was addicted to several different drugs, and that she broke into a couple places. So I hate to label her as a kleptomaniac, but proof is in the pudding. Finally, after about 10 months dating, things got so out of hand and she became so verbally and emotionally abusive and attempted some physical abuse. So ultimately I knew I had to get out of the relationship. So I started to write a book, which I'm still writing now, a memoir. It was my greatest form of therapy and analysis. I really started to ask, what did I do wrong? My God, I was the Brit for so long. Are you with me for love? Are you with me for money? And you know, what happens if I take away the money? But I think he deep down knew that this was not going to end well for him. And he got afraid and ran. Well, I have to be honest, e even to this day, I feel like I'm deserved an apology. How could I continue carrying this huge hurt and this overwhelming anger for a person who was just quite literally not capable? Here it is, part two of our special bonus episodes of the Sugar Baby Confessionals. Last time, David, our favorite Hollywood producer, opened up with blistering honesty about his tragic love affair with the Sugar Baby. We talked a lot about mental health and relationships, as well as getting an insight from an experienced sugar daddy as to the LA sugar dating world. Plus, Ruby and David role-played the Brit and Catherine, David's ex, apologizing to each other which got Ruby all verklempt, so you won't want to miss that. If you haven't listened to it yet, do go back and hear it first. It's a poignant and funny episode. This week, we're tackling the effect of the Me Too movement, Harvey Weinstein, feminism and sugar dating, and so much more. It's a doozy. Uh, a floozy doozy? <laughs> I am clearly delirious from editing. This time, David takes over the interviewing, giving Ruby a grilling, and I'm more than happy to sit back and let the two of them spar. Join us as we unzip the mysteries of the sugar dating world on the Sugar Baby Confessionals. We pick up when David brought up the potential darkness inherent in becoming a sugar baby. I think that the potential for abuse and the level of darkness on the website is much greater than you guys have seen. But isn't any tool is a tool, it's, so it kind of depends how you use it, right? Is it that you have observed other people misusing it or taking advantage? All the time. The power dynamic is one of the things that can get skewed in a possibly unhealthy way. You know, I've been thinking about that a lot lately especially because I'm a Hollywood producer and I see many mm. people that I know falling by the wayside, most of them deservedly. And I'm actually at a chapter now where I'm literally writing as that I went into sex addiction groups to question, was I a sex addict at the exact same time that the first article in New York Times about Harvey Weinstein came out. Mm. Wow. And how men all over the country or the world were starting to ask what is appropriate and what it's not. And I was very comfortable with my own place in that because I've never used power. To get what you want. No, never. No, I never slept with anybody I was working with. I never abused anybody. Um, but I had to ask, and I think Catherine once had a conversation with me where I said, do you think they're ever going to start outing sugar daddies? David's really looking into the abyss and not flinching when it looks back at him. It's impressive that he's able to grapple with such sensitive issues so honestly. Is this an abuse of power? And I don't think that's the case. I think you were great yeah. to address it in the podcast, but it's it's not because a woman has as much power in the situation as man. Whether they're taking money or not, a woman has the power to go to work at Starbucks if she doesn't like what she's doing. I feel like this has so much to do with each person's agency. And one of the things that I feel very uncomfortable about with a certain element of you know, the liberal left and feminism. I mean, oh, here I'll, we go. No, uh, just, <laughs> I'll, I'll be the first to say that, that I think of myself as a feminist because mm. I feel like men and women, they should be valued equally and they should have the same opportunities and they should be able to have the same education and all the rest of it. But to say that something is just blanketly wrong because the system takes advantage of 
a particular sex. In this instance, obviously, it's women. There's just, there's no nuance there. There's no agency for the women involved. And it's a bit patronizing, isn't it? Because it's Well, it feels that... exceptionally patronizing. And I'm not saying, and obviously, you know, David has kind of seen a lot more of the dark underbelly than I have. I'm not saying that those situations don't exist. Of course they exist. Could I have gotten myself involved in something like that? Absolutely. Of course I could. But I'm not going to right? That's my agency. That's me making like decisions about my life. Mm -hmm. And to say that other women aren't able to make those decisions, ugh, I don't know, man. We've discussed this in depth in our two feminism episodes 12 and 13. I'm interested to see what David's take on this is, as I make the point that some women, possibly younger, more naive women with less life experience than Ruby, could fall prey to dangerous men who take advantage of them. The basic problem of all these women who are, you know, confronting their abusers is they were not in control. They had no, say, very little say in it. Did very little to do with money. Half of these actresses who are coming out against these men are successful actresses. It's so about control and power. And I yeah. really, I know that there's some abuse that can happen being a sugar daddy in terms of dishonesty or being a sugar baby and having dishonest and be having three of them and maybe bringing in the health issues of you know safe sex and all that you know and 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 honestly there's some issues but they're completely separated from what's going on with men and women in the world in terms of yeah. their abuse of power particularly with Harvey Weinstein and you know someone like Louis CK they were abusing their position and the women that they were abusing felt powerless. They were in positions where they thought they were going into one sort of situation and they were suddenly confronted with a whipped yeah. out penis <laughs> or yeah. um, whatever it was. And, you know, obviously that's very different. And by the way, that's not even a man and woman thing. I have a friend, an actor I worked with many years ago who recently, a young male actor, a straight young male actor who came, came out against a, um, a very famous Italian filmmaker and said that he had been abused when he was 24 by the filmmaker. It's a power thing. It's it's who's in charge, and and it goes over all races. And it's a fascinating thing to contrast. I think in your book, it's good that you're addressing it head on and going, "This isn't what this lifestyle is about." Right. What an interesting insight. I can't wait to read hmm. more Hollywood gossip about like <laughs> I'm sure you could tell us all kinds of hairy stories. I don't want to say maybe Harry was the wrong Harry? word. Harry? Yeah. That, that I don't know if I want to hear the Harry stories. <laughs> <laughs> no Harry stories. I'm well groomed. <laughs> I will say something that fascinated me that you guys discussed in your podcast from one of your episodes, which was, Ruby, you made a comment once about as you got more and more into this lifestyle, you started looking at the people around you and wondering what they were doing. You know, I still do that. How many people were hiding their own stuff? How many people were doing that? I believe Hollywood is no different than the world. It's just we just talk about ourselves a lot and they take pictures of us. So we just were, were a microcosm, but I don't really think we're any crazier. We just admit it or it's admitted for us. <laughs> but I do think that one of the things that I've seen now that my eyes have been opened up to what alternate relationships, there's a whole world of people who are having sugar relationships under a different title whether they meet on Instagram. I was talking to a girlfriend of mine who says, oh, you know, I don't need to go on Seeking Arrangement to get a sugar daddy. I go to a bar and, and within 30 minutes talking to the guy, he's offering to pay my rent. You know, it's just the way you term it and the coins you use and the, and the phrase. Yeah. It's so fascinating to discover that being a sugar baby is almost the most traditional relationship there is. And uh, let me tell you something, I'm still taking care of my ex-wife and I'm not sleeping with her. Well, I mean, and this begs a really great question if we're going to phrase it through this particular lens, who is more immoral? Is it the woman who meets a guy online and the two of them are very straightforward and upfront with each other going, hey, listen, this is what I need. Okay, this is what you need. Cool. That matches up. We like each other enough. Let's head straight into an arrangement. Or is it a woman who really and truly marries a guy just because he's got a certain level of income and she doesn't really care that much for him, but, you know, performs certain wifely duties <laughs> because in exchange, she gets a certain lifestyle. I why mean, am I thinking of Melania right now? <laughs> right, well, yes, <laughs> exactly. And why does society, generally speaking, of course, not those of us who are in the room, look at one of those things and goes, yeah, oof, you know, that's that's off color. That's not cool. That's 
taboo and the other one is somehow got this like stamp of approval. It seems really odd to me. Mm. You know, what's even more fascinating to me is that there's there's a whole gray area. I honestly believe that the nature of taking care of a woman and providing security turns them on. Well, I'd say that personally, I get turned on by being an equal partner with my husband. But if I'm perfectly honest, he has always earned more than me and has supported me when I've taken time off to write novels or make podcasts, which frankly is a turn on. That support. So... Have I just proved David's point? And does that make me less of a feminist? Big time! Again, I just keep reminding you that you're not the norm. You're a weirdo, Ruby. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're super norm. You know, you're you're extraordinary. You're not you're not unhealthy. You're doing it in a difficult way. But I do believe that there's a whole psyche of a lot of these women who go on the site that are torn. You know, they want to be taken care of, but they don't want to admit that they're asking for money. I've seen people get in arguments about how to handle the money and how not to. And I know men who say, Oh, I would never do that, but then spend thirty thousand dollars to hire a private plane to pick the woman up. The whole psyche of how money... I suppose as an exercise in clarity, the sugar baby experience is quite good because you get more used to being like, no, this is what I want. Here's the list. This Mm. is exactly it. This is what it looks like. Well, that's what I thought when I first went on the site. I'm going to have these relationships and they'll be honest and clean and clear. But, you know, they get just as complicated. I can't tell you how many relationships I've been in, how many arrangements where you get up on fine and then suddenly something happens and you're like, wait a minute, is this a real relationship? Is it not? Are we going somewhere or not? I've had relationships where suddenly I'll say, you know, and I know you faced this with the Brit, which you had to ask. You, you guys stopped seeing each other and the allowance stopped coming and then you got back together and the allowance wasn't forthcoming and you said, wait a minute, what does that mean? Like, So there's gray areas in all of it. I think those people on the sides, that the Melanias and the Donalds who just do it for power, just do it for money. I don't want to judge them as being immoral because I don't know what she went through as a child, but, you know, what turns her on and what doesn't. They may have a great fucking sex life for all we know. <laughs> wow. Wow. Oh, my gosh. I hope not. I Good Lord. It. Why? I don't know. There's something so repugnant about <laughs> For one thing, him. what if the carpet matches the drapes with him? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> what if he's got a merkin down there that looks as creepy as... <laughs> like a comb over on his balls. Ah, uh, yeah, you went. You went there. You went there. It's terrible. Is the FBI going to come after me now? All I'm saying is that having grown up in a world where a lot of marriages seem on the outside for she's just marrying him for money and he's just marrying her because she's hot and sexy. The truth is, even those relationships, they're conflicted and they're gray. And rare is the somebody who just marries for money and safety mm. and security and that be and and you can't judge that as moral. What would be the problem with that? Even I'm if doing they did? a podcast about Georgia Hare right now, and that's all Regency romance. And what is the whole premise of all of those books? Is young woman she's got to take what she's got, whether it's looks or whatever. Usually, slightly more impoverished, trying to catch the best husband that she can. And in those days, they were really practical about it. They were like, well, you know, what can he offer? Like a bird on the wire. Like a drunk in a midnight choir I have tried in my way to be free Like a worm on a hook Like an eye from some old-fashioned book It was the shape of our love that twisted me. There's so many shades of grey, even with the sugar dating thing versus escorts versus prostitutes. Mm-hmm. There's like a weird gradation of judgment. <laughs> yeah, well, that that's kind of what I was alluding to, and I don't think I articulated it very well, but that's what I was trying to allude to when, you know, society mm. says this type of essentially arrangement yeah. is okay, but this type over here, yeah. there, there's something taboo about it. Like a bird. On the wire Like a drunk in the midnight choir I have tried 
in my way to be free. And it doesn't it's preclude a relationship that begins that way. It doesn't preclude emotions from forming afterwards. It's it's kind of like, who is everybody else to say that can't start off as something and then Melania grows really, really fond of Donald. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's a terrible example because... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're the extreme. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Well, I mean, and also I'm making a judgment based on knowing nothing about it. So, you know, and my own prejudices and stuff. And, they, and that's quite telling in and of itself. I have a question for you, Ruth. How do you handle the shame issue of it? Because you obviously don't have any personal shame. But how do you handle the public shame? When you're out with friends, do your friends, do your family, do they know what, you, what you've done and what you do? Do you go on dates with a favorite person and your friends and say, oh, by the way, we're sleeping to other people. And oh, by the way, I, I get paid for the relationship. I do have quite a few friends who know. In fact, I've very recently opened up to a couple of people that live in my neighborhood so that was a big step for me it did not go well when i did that in the previous country where i lived so really yeah you know i'd say i have a couple of family members who know but as i'm sure you picked up from listening to the podcast favorite person is extremely private he's a much more closed person than i am in the sense that he doesn't like to share details about his life so of course he he knows all about the podcast and totally gave me the thumbs up to chat with sarah about everything but i think what it comes down to is that if it were up to me i would just be open totally out of the closet for lack of a better term <laughs> out of respect for favorite mm -hmm. person i've chosen to remain quite quiet and anonymous and no one in his family knows that is a tricky thing because so much of this is about our sex lives and so you know i don't know about you but i don't really like to wax poetic about my sexual proclivities with my mom anyway <laughs> you know what i mean like <laughs> even if they were really vanilla i wouldn't be like yeah so he was on top of me last night, you know, um, <laughs> we wouldn't be having that conversation. So there's a certain point at which I feel it is just appropriate for people to not know this and for us to not speak about it. But for those who I'm very good friends with, people who I want to feel like they really know who I am, it is a big part of my life. And if I'm out at a bar with girlfriends and I see a guy that I think is pretty cute and I want to go chat him up, I don't want the friends who are with me to go like, oh my gosh, what is she <laughs> doing? She's been married for 10 years. And, you know, right. I want them to understand that I'm really not betraying favorite person. I'm not doing anything that is outside of the spectrum of our marriage. So... Yeah, so I, I stuck my toe in the water of telling, so there are two very lovely ladies that are in my neighborhood that I'm, I've become quite close friends with, and I was absolutely delighted. They were so relaxed about it. In fact, they both asked me if they could listen to the podcast, so I have sent them the link. <laughs> That's always like quite hairy for me, I have to tell you, because there is so much about my life in that podcast. I feel exceptionally vulnerable with people when they've listened to it. You know what, David, I'm sure you're going to be feeling like this. You're going to write your book and I'm sure it'll be published and loads of people are going to read it and then they're going to want to talk to you and you'll go, holy shit, like you know so much about my life and I know nothing about you. And it creates this very interesting dynamic between yourself and that other person. I found this when we met up with the lovely sugar baby who contacted you, who was visiting, oh, yeah. Yeah. and her husband. So I have met a fan in person, and <laughs> we had a lovely afternoon and a fabulous lunch, and you know they were really great. But it was slightly strange at first because they just knew so much about me. Yeah. I, I didn't know what to do with that because, of course, in the ordinary day-to-day -day life that you live that's not how information is exchanged, right? You meet a new person and you're kind of both at square one and you, you slowly build up the narrative arc of your life ah. and the interesting bits that you want to give them. I'm the opposite. I spill it all out now. <laughs> <laughs> Whether I meet them on Seeking Arrangement or Bumble. As a matter of fact, I had a matchmaker who approached me and said, you know, we want to introduce you to women. I said, okay, but you have to know this because this is what I'm going to tell them on the first date. And I, <laughs> I don't want them running back to you and saying, oh my God, he's 
he's a pervert. <laughs> He's my kind of pervert. <laughs> I'm fully prepared for that. For me, the only boundaries, and I'm obviously crossing them a little bit, that I'm concerned about is my children and my and my family. I don't want to bring disgrace on them. But I'm writing the book from a place of, okay, when they're 18, they'll can read this. And I'll explain to them, you know, I think kids, if you communicate it well, and honestly, they can handle anything. Here, David pauses to tell us that his boundaries include divulging information about his family. He'll be leaving them out of the book as well. For him, it's important to keep the two areas of his life separate. Like we all have our boundaries. Yeah. In your case, I don't even think Ruby is your real name. <laughs> no, no, it's not. I didn't even get to choose my name. Sarah chose my <laughs> name. I've been going by Ruby hey. for years now. <laughs> I don't think I would have chosen it. Well, I mean, you know, there was Jemima. There Jemima. Was, uh... Do I look like a Jemima? <laughs> Good Lord. <laughs> You're killing me. <laughs> I don't know how you guys had these conversations for months about these things and call everybody favorite people and FP and Brit. I'm like, I spill it all out. There have been a couple of times where... Yeah, I had to cut it. Yeah, she, she would just cut it out. <laughs> the do. magic of editing. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that happened more in the beginning. We got more used to it. We'd be in the zone of like, yeah. where we... yeah. And I think you've also developed the persona of Ruby now. And Do you think so? She's a person. She's fully fleshed. <laughs> <laughs> I have another question. Yeah, please. I have an answer. So you fell in love with an arrangement. It crossed the boundaries that you had expected would happen with your husband. Now you're dating again and you're open to more experiences. But are you more guarded now? Do you think there's the potential of you falling in love again or... Do you run from that? Do you change your criteria based on that? What would happen if, has, have, has your husband said to you, listen, let's not go down this road again. I mean, yeah, go out and have some fun. But like, you know, what do you, I don't know. That's an excellent question. I'm not sure if I would use the word guarded. I remain as open as I've ever been. If someone asks a question, I'll give them the answer. There are very, very few things that I feel uncomfortable discussing. I think for me, I've decided that it's a time issue. One of the big problems that favorite person and I got into when I fell in love with the Brit is that, of course, I wanted to spend a lot of time with him. And favorite person was like, but hold on a second. You've got a family. You've got, you know, and for me, I was just thinking, hey, well, the more the merrier. I would have loved to introduce favorite person in the Brit. I would have loved to be able to spend time with everyone all at once. That was obviously never going to happen, even though for a very delusional long while, I convinced myself that we could get there. Ha. So favorite person and I had a very serious conversation, very honest conversation with each other when we decided that we were going to open things up again. And that was neither one of us felt comfortable, ready, willing to be polyamorous. And I didn't want either one of us to put ourselves in a situation that I was in last time where it just kind of happened. You know, you screw up once. Okay, fine. That's understandable. You screw up twice. Then it's like, well, what the fuck is going on here? Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you knew better the second time around. So don't create that situation. And we're, we're not into rules because rules in my mind are made to be broken. But one of the guidelines that I have for myself is that I don't want to spend too much time with one particular person because... In that time, that's when the feelings can really deepen and the more significant attachment takes root. So that's kind of the first thing for me. And the second thing is, even if I were to fall head over heels in love with someone else, I would not put favorite person or myself through the paces that I did last time because he and I have not consciously made the agreement that yes, this is the manner in which we're opening up. We, we want to try polyamory in the full sense of that word, meaning you love other people, you're kind of extending your family, so on and so forth. We're just not there. And I don't know, maybe one day we will be. I know that I'm capable of doing it. I don't know about favorite person. I think by nature, he's probably a hell of a lot more monogamous than I am. So I'm not certain about that. So at the moment, I've dated people and, you know, I think much like you, I'm very picky. So <laughs> I'll go out on a date maybe two dates and if things are not clicking the way I know that they can right. I'm just like okay that's you're, we're good we're good thank you thank you for playing next <laughs> goodbye <laughs> 
and that's fine. I go on to the the site just no more than like two or three days at a time because it's it so starts to feel a bit onerous after that. And I chat with a few people and I'll I'll meet a couple of them. You know, it's like this very long process. And it's fun. It's entertaining. And I kind of like to think about the balance of my life. So my domestic life, my marriage, my children, my friends, they provide the stability, the order, right? I have, a, you know, obviously the daily routine and especially with little kids, it's like I'm very disciplined with them about what their routine is and you know, going to school and helping with homework and playing with them on the weekends and so on and so forth. But if that were all of my right. life, I would go crazy. No. I'm a little bit wild. You know, I, I need to be debauched every once in a while. I'm shocked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Shock. And so I look at my sex life as where I can let in, if it's curated properly, that's where I can let in just a little bit of chaos, just enough to make me feel alive and desirable and sexy. And obviously it ignites things between favorite person and myself. So I feel like if I get that balance right, then things work beautifully and i'm really content and i feel quite happy so you said that your favorite person is now dating as well is he on the website yes so it seems to me you guys have a net sum gain of zero you get money from men and then he gives women money <laughs> <laughs> i never thought of that but that's true uh, yeah yeah i mean listen it it doesn't right. quite work out like that because i do tend to get more than he's willing to give people but <laughs> Are you trying to say he's a bit of a skin flint? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's so cheap. He's so cheap, my husband. That's so funny. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I have to tell you, he absolutely loves it. Like when he's in a phase where he's like, cool, I'm in the mood. Like, let me meet a couple new people. Um, it's so exciting for him. You know, he, he really, he digs it. And, and as his partner, I like to see him get dressed up for another woman. And You introduced me to another word. I had never heard the word compersion before you used it. Oh, really? That's such a great word. For those of you who don't know what compersion is, it's the sense of satisfaction one gets from knowing one's partner is sexually fulfilled, even if it's not with you. It's kind of like the opposite of jealousy. And by the way, I shared that for a long time. Monogamy is more practical than having an open relationship because I think that it's hard enough for one person to believe in an open relationship. You're lucky in that you both do. So you both have compersion. That's that's hard to find in one, let alone two people. But for a long time, when Catherine had other sugar daddies, I didn't want to be in the room, but it turned me on. Right? I know. I didn't want her seeing people that she wasn't being paid by. Like our ground rules shifted over the course of the relationship. Yeah. We had several deep negotiations, I call them, at the ground rules. The first one is you could do whatever you want. <laughs> I can do whatever I want. Then she dated a guy who wasn't paying her and I dated a girl who wasn't being paid and we both flipped out like what the fuck <laughs> how can you do that that's real dating right right yeah you know you're taking all the rules off so we made an agreement okay you delete tinder and i'll delete bumble and we'll only sleep with people who pay for us and that worked out for a while you know that's so interesting when we had that conversation fp and myself and decided to open things up again that was one of the things that he was very particular about he's like listen the fact that you receive an allowance, you received a gift or whatever, like I need that because that is the thing that tells me that I'm the priority. And I and I totally get it. Yeah. Yeah. One hundred percent. Well, it'd be interesting to see what happens when you care for somebody again, truly deeply. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Um, who knows? Life is an adventure. <laughs> I just have to take it as it comes. But I think that I'm so much more well equipped to I don't know, kind of handle a situation. And in fact, that's one of the things that listening to the podcast makes me feel so cringy is just how naive I was. It's like, because I was happy and I was genuinely happy. I have always been very much in love with favorite person. He is the best man I've ever met in my entire life. The fact that he loves me back is just a miracle I've never gotten over. I really thought that that would insulate me from falling in love with somebody else. And I was so dead wrong about that. 
I feel like I've had, you know, I've had that experience. I'm older, I'm wiser. I get it. I know what it feels like when I'm starting to fall for someone. And, you know, I won't say that I'm guarded about it, but I'm mindful of it. I think when you can see something happening, you can choose to make different decisions to either further it or to kind of just let it cool down. I have to admit, I wonder sometimes if this is true. It's like if you open up all the doors and windows in a house, sooner or later someone's going to sneak in, especially with someone as loving as Ruby. She's a boundlessly affectionate person, operating at 100% focus with whoever she's giving her attention to. I worry sometimes that someone like the Brit will come along again and steal her heart before she manages to guard her feelings. <laughs> what about if he falls for somebody? Well, see, that, that would be a very interesting situation because <laughs> I'm cool with being a sister wife. I mean, I know, <laughs> I know that it would be very tricky and difficult, but as you can tell, I love talking about feelings. So I think that <laughs> if, if he fell in love with the right person, I would definitely be open to becoming polyamorous. I mean, let me put it this way. There's no way in hell I would leave my husband just because he fell in love with another woman. I mean, he would literally have to start treating me like crap and neglecting me and doing all sorts of things that I honestly don't think he's capable of doing. Right, because he didn't leave you. Yeah, that's very true. He didn't leave me, but it's more than that. I, I wouldn't want to leave him because of that. I would want to figure out how to make it a part of our lives together. I mean, I'm sure it would be really difficult. There's probably loads of stuff about it that I have no clue because we've not had that experience, but I'm definitely committed, so. Right. Well, again, I say it. You and your husband are extraordinary and rare, even on an open-minded website like Seeking Arrangement. Well, thank you. Even in these relationships, you're definitely not the norm. <laughs> and I'd like to think I'm not the norm, but for a while I was the norm. I was that man who didn't want a relationship and just wanted to have sexy relationships with people, whether it was for a night or a month or two months. But I've come around and, and now I want more of a relationship and probably monogamy. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think if two people are capable of doing what you and your husband are capable of doing, it's great. But I actually, if there's one thing that I wish I had done differently in this relationship was the minute I knew that I was falling in love with this woman, I would have taken all of the others off the table. I would have given her more money so that she could afford to take the others off the table. And I would have said, let's explore this. Let's just see how deep we can go ourselves before we entertain other people. Because I think that my desire for, and, and I, I do, I do think that monogamy is unnatural. The most I'll give it now, it's, I don't think it's unethical. But, you know, the one thing I wish I'd done was say, listen, I, I recognize this is not just an arrangement. Where can it go? And I'm open to spending the rest of my life with one person. I think if I met somebody who was like yourself and had the same conversion I did and there was no jealousy, I'd probably be open to exploring it. But at this point in my life, I think that I've had so much more experience in the sugar daddy lifestyle that I'm, I would have no problem discarding it. Hey, little girl, is your daddy home? Did he go and leave you all alone? No, I got a bad desire. That's really interesting you found that out about yourself. Yeah. So I want to know, after interviewing me for hours and doing the whole podcast, and of course you know all about my crazy-ass dating life, and also having these really great conversations with David and listening to it from this sugar daddy perspective, I mean, do you feel like you've changed at all? Honestly, I feel like in some sense you've almost thought about my story more than I have. <laughs> because you're the person who created such a beautiful narrative arc around it. Well, 
Yeah, it definitely has, especially in the beginning. And obviously in the editing process, you listen again and again and things sink in. I found that I had certain initial reactions, which would then gradually evolve over time. As you know, I've kind of been in a monogamous relationship since I was 19. So I, I genuinely don't have any of the experiences. So there is a voyeuristic element to it for sure. And I think I've always had a very open mind. I love exploring dangerous things or taboo things in an open way but not so much in real life not so much in naxing them <laughs> in real life i'm very no, we'll risk-averse. leave that to you ruby <laughs> yeah. right. but i've never understood people who like make a judgment and go this is how i'm living my life and everybody has to live their life like this or else they're evil and wrong particularly if they haven't ever heard a story and i also don't like it when people are incapable of empathy just because they don't happen to know someone who who is going through a situation. Having said that, I think this podcast has given people that insight and I hope has allowed them to go, well, she's not a crazy person. She's not a hoe who's just out to grab what she can. She's intelligent and charismatic and charming. And what she's saying sounds not so very far away from the stuff that I've thought about. And I think it's given a lot of people like myself a safe space to explore those things hmm. and be able to digest it and kind of process it without having to, without having to like chuck the marriage in or like whatever, you know. <laughs> I suppose one of the things that I felt like I needed you guys to talk about, this was my need <laughs> to share. Obviously, I love sharing my story and the lessons I've learned, but I I do think that there are the hoes and Johns and unhealthy people who are distancing themselves from attachment and not using power, but using money to avoid relationships. Mm. Mm. And there are people with diseases and there are people who are straight up escorts on the site. And there are men who are lying about not being married when they really are. And there are Men and women both have multiple partners and are pathologically dishonest about it, risking people's health. I feel like one of the messages that I needed to bring to your podcast was that you interviewed two extraordinary women who are handling their shit and venturous and open and honest. They're not the norm. It's not like the sick, unhappy, unhealthy people are the extremes. Rumi is the extreme. Wow, that's okay. kind of a downer. <laughs> I, you know, I have to be honest, I did not realize that. It's yeah. What would you characterize as the norm? I would say the norm are women who, who are incapable of supporting themselves financially because of either their beauty or their trauma in their childhood or their experiences are just physically not able to support themselves. On my profile on the website, I say being a sugar baby should not be your job. If you don't have another job that's earning you enough income to pay your rent, I'm not comfortable dating. I want to be the cream on the cake. I want to be something extra. I want to be something that that provides you more than just safety, but enjoyment and entertainment and, and intimacy and fun. I don't want to be your job. And I would say the majority of women especially in Los Angeles, I would say 30% of the women are Russians, are Eastern European women who, even if they're capable of having a job, come to America on a tourist visa and can't take work. They're not legally allowed to, so they become prostitutes. I avoid them like the plague. I say on my profile, English should be your first language. This is an interesting, if somewhat bleak insight into the LA world of sugar dating. It's one we covered a little in our feminism episodes, where we talked about the crossover between prostitution and sugar dating. It's clear that David feels very differently about the out-and-out prostitutes than he does about the girls for whom he will be the cream on the cake, an adjunct to their existing lives and careers, as opposed to the source of their entire income. Clearly for him, there's more scope for an emotional connection within his idea of sugar dating. He can be the generous benefactor, easing the way for his sugar babies to fulfill their own careers, as opposed to merely a John, for whom all such romantic ideas are stripped down to the dollar amount. But I don't think that's the case outside of major metropolitan areas, because obviously in New York and Miami and Los Angeles, that's where people emigrate to. But I think that there's another percentage of the people who are either models or artists who take the easy money and rather than work as a waitress, support themselves this way. There's very few married women on the website. Ruby, you're one in a thousand. Yeah, I have had a number of people comment to me how they really found that alluring. 
that I was married. I'm like, okay. Yeah, and didn't we get Madeline to change her profile because she wasn't having that much luck? At one point, you suggested she change to say that she was in a relationship. I mean, she was getting lots of attention, but it wasn't the kind of people that she wanted. Yeah, it was like time wasters and stuff like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So how did you come across the podcast? When I started writing my book, I must have bought two dozen memoirs to research. And I started buying podcasts and looking at YouTube videos of anybody who would talk about their life. And of course, in the process, I said, well, I wonder if there's a biography about another sugar daddy or a sugar baby. And I found that they were a couple small ones. There was a how to meet your next sugar baby book, but there was nothing that really dove into what it means to be one, what it's really like. And in the form of a memoir, I found there was nothing like what I want to write about. Mm. And I looked up podcasts to sit and listen to in Los Angeles traffic and <laughs> typed in Sugar Baby. And there was and there was one or two that were very amateur and, and more like some young woman to think about all the daddies she's had and how much money she's made and how she drives Mercedes. But I was really surprised when I found your guys and just dove in and loved everything that you were talking about. Ah, cool. And literally the minute I finished the last episode, I sent Sarah an email saying, you got to talk to me <laughs> <laughs> because I got a story that will add a few elements that you might not have talked about. The funny thing was, my first thought was, Hollywood producer? Yeah, right. Great, another scam artist trying to get in touch with Ruby through me. Or one of the endless guys or bots, I can never tell, who are always sending me DMs offering to be my sugar daddy. Yeah, I know. Listen to the podcast, dude. But then I checked him out online, had an extensive pre-interview interview with him, and realized he was legit. Yeah, I certainly think it has. But I'm really excited to read your book when it comes out. I know that you've you've probably been keeping back a few juicy tidbits for your readers. (laughs) Even if it's not the dark stuff, I have amazing stories that, again, I don't think that you guys have gone into the breadth of. I mean, I've dated women who are age appropriate. I've dated Europeans. I've dated women who didn't want money and wanted me to make a movie with them. I've dated, I think I told one great story to Sarah about how dating a woman who was divorced in a horrible divorce and how it impacted my own relationship with my ex-wife as I was negotiating my divorce terms. I had met this woman who was 42 and had two children and was in a terrible divorce and her husband was abusive and she didn't want to fight because she just wanted to get out of the marriage. She was being taken to the cleaners and he was in a sense getting money from her in their divorce, which didn't make any sense to me. And we had a wonderful four-month arrangement And I ended up going into my own mediation with my ex-wife and saying, you know what, just give her whatever she wants for twice as long (laughs) because I don't want my wife to be Mm. forced to end up on seeking arrangement. The question that popped into my mind here was, why wouldn't he want his wife to become a sugar baby? Is it more the being forced aspect that troubles him? As in, he'd hate his ex to be in such desperate straits that she was forced to become a sugar baby? Or is it somewhat more confusing? that the idea of her being a sugar baby in and of itself is repellent. On the whole, based on the fact that he was about to embark on a real relationship with Catherine, I don't think it's the latter. But still, for a moment there, I wondered. It opened my eyes about, you know, how poorly men treat women. I dated porn stars that were on the website. I've dated younger women. I dated a woman who literally, like, after she gave me your name, she said, I should warn you, you know, when you Google me, you're going to find out that I have this criminal record. And she had a full-on explanation for it. Sorry, what had she done, though? We missed that. It sounded like you said animal cruelty. Yes, animal cruelty. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Who gets arrested for animal cruelty? What? She had an explanation for it. She told me that she had an animal shelter and that she had only been licensed to carry 40 dogs and people kept bringing her dogs. And the next thing you know, she had 80 and she couldn't say no to these poor dogs until the city raided her and she got arrested for animal cruelty. So, I mean, I have, there's so many different stories that I think that, you know, of the type of people that are on there, crazy and not crazy, young, old, black, white, everybody's got their reasons. I found the seeking ring specifically among all the websites is like this watering hole for every different type of person. 
it's been really, really cool being able to have you guys have a conversation together. Mm, that has been lovely. <laughs> Are those your sugar daddies? <laughs> That's not, that is that is not my phone, by the way. It's my phone. That is so <gasps> your phone. So I didn't bring my phone down oh, here. Where is it? I, don't even I know can't believe is. you're blaming me for this amateur hour, and meanwhile, that is your phone. It's it's my husband, Mike. <laughs> I'm so embarrassed, guys. Sorry. You're killing me right now. All right. Well, it was a pleasure. And please just reach out anytime you want to add, you know, ask more questions or do more. I'm happy to do it. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Thanks. Dana. Thank you so much. And it was such a pleasure to chat with you. Thanks for being so open and for yeah. sharing and for asking Absolutely. questions of Ruby as well. I think you are asking much more interesting questions, obviously, than most people would. <laughs> And oh, I loved it. This was fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much. What a pleasure. Thanks, guys. All right. Lovely to chat. Bye. Bye, David. Bye. I'm so glad David got in touch with us and was game enough to discuss the sugar dating world with Ruby and I. Getting his perspective was truly eye opening. When I was thinking about it later, there was one thing I found especially interesting to chew on. It seemed as if, for David, he finds the sugar dating situation not too dissimilar from regular dating for someone of his financial and social status. In earlier discussions, he mentioned being approached by millionaire matchmakers whose sole purpose is matching up women, mostly of a lesser socioeconomic level but armed with beauty, with men like him. As Ruby said, there's very little daylight between the two concepts. For most of us regular folk, however, the idea of being paid for sex is still taboo. I guess the confusion comes in with the sex to romance ratio. Commodifying a romantic relationship still feels uncomfortable for many, which is why when the sexual transactional arrangements bleed into true emotional territory, things begin to get murky, as both Ruby and David have admitted. The best thing about our discussion was getting the male perspective from someone so self-aware and open, and the interaction between him and Ruby was fascinating to observe. I got to sit back and let them interrogate each other in a way I probably wouldn't have been able to achieve on my own. Luckily, they had a great rapport and, I think, a true sympathy for each other's experiences. I hope you've enjoyed these two bonus episodes. If you'd like to buy us a coffee, you can go to fablegazers.com and click on support us. Our Indiegogo campaign is closed, but you can PayPal us some cash if you fancy helping us continue to produce work like this. Please write a review, rate and subscribe, as these sorts of things help to make more people aware of us. Look out for season 2, which is all about a criminally underappreciated author I love, Georgette Hare. Yep, season 2 is a podcast for book lovers, and features guests like Stephen Fry, Joanne Harris, producer Andy Patterson, writer Harriet Evans, and many more. So long, this has been the Sugar Baby Confessionals. This episode was recorded, produced and edited by me, Sarah Mae Tucson, with production help from Beth Keen. Mike Scott assisted with production and Geraldine Elliott gave editorial assistance. The music used in this episode is from Danny Green's albums Obituaries and Leish, as well as Jerome Alexander's Amazing Message to Bears tunes. Special thanks also to brilliant singer-songwriter Nadine Khoury, who let me use her fantastic songs for the podcast. Ricky Demiani's music also appears and look out for his new album, which is out in early 2020. I'm singing some backup on there. Comment and take part in our discussions on social media. We're at FableGazers on Instagram and at Fable underscore Gazers on Twitter. You can find Message to Bears here, messagetobears.com. Danny Green's music here, leishmusic.com. That's L-A-I-S-H music.com. Ricky Demiani's music lives here, mockdeer.bandcamp.com. And check out Nadine Curry's work here. Nadine Curry, that's K H O U R I dot com. The Sugar Baby Confessionals is a Fablegazers production. <laughs>